Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, we'll just give uh, people uh, two minutes to come through, and then we, we will start. Um, so if you can just bear with us. And uh, maybe while we wait, uh, just some housekeeping. If you can mute your microphone when you are not speaking, and uh, those who have variable um, bandwidth, um, if you are a speaker, if you can just uh, pop your face so we can at least have a connection to your human face before we get your avatar, that would be very good. I think it makes a difference to how we um, experience uh, this um, type of uh, meeting, if we can kind of like uh, put a face to the people speaking. So you don't have to keep your video on for the duration of the meeting, but it would be good to just see who we are speaking with. Um, thank you. I think we, we, we can start. I will just uh, quickly do a, a, a run of uh, the meeting um, and uh, we, can, we can start. We have an hour and a half less now, so uh, we will try and be efficient on time. Um, to our speakers, I will raise my hand. Uh, it doesn't mean five, it means like uh, uh, summarize uh, your time is up. Uh, so if you see me raising my hand, not the virtual hand, but my real hand, it means uh, your, your time is up. So good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for making the time to participate uh, in our session as part of the Community-Based Adaptation 16. Um, which is an event uh, that uh, SDI, the organization I'm uh, director for, it, it's secretariat in Cape Town, as well as our partner Cities Alliance are very privileged to uh, host. My name is Beth Chitekwebiti. Um, I'll be your moderator for this event. Uh, we have a great array of speakers uh, who will share uh, experiences across the SDI network of locally led adaptation. We also have the privilege of uh, our partners from the um, city uh, authorities in Freetown, as well as uh, uh, Cities Alliance, who we have uh, we are part of, as well as uh, have worked with for over two decades now. Uh, to also bring in their perspective into what it is that locally led adaptation uh, puts on the table to address uh, the, the climate emergency. Um, as a network, um, our experience uh, has always been that uh, when communities uh, who are mostly marginalized in our cities are faced uh, with an emergency, they, they react and they have to adapt as a, as a matter of course, there's no option. And uh, the processes that have uh, developed uh, have a very clear indication of why this is necessary, but also why it is important that this becomes uh, not only policy, but also practice and that resources are put into these processes. Uh, the speakers we have from our network will discuss what they are doing at the local level and uh, how this is being integrated into our cities, their cities react when there is a crisis, both uh, natural as well as man-made crises that uh, communities of the urban poor have often have to uh, address. Um, so it is a privilege uh, to, uh, to, to have all of you here. We will essentially start with a, uh, the screening of a short uh, film uh, made by our 
um, youth uh, media team that we call KYC TV, Know Your City TV. This is um, um, a, a, a really impactful way of documenting people's experiences on the ground. And then we will go into our community experiences uh, from uh, Uganda, Malawi, the Philippines, uh, as well as Sierra Leone. And then we will have uh, responses from our partners uh, from Cities Alliance. We have Julian Baskin. And then we have Mr. Abdul Karim Mara, who is a development planning officer from the Freetown City Council. And then we will have uh, about 20 minutes of a moderated discussion at the end. Uh, we also hope that we can, uh, at the end, have uh, an opportunity for participants to also uh, put in their inputs. Um, so thank you. And uh, the, the short film, please. <laughs> of unemployment in Sierra Leone. Many people have chosen business as their major source of livelihood, especially youth and women. But the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic has posed serious challenge to these businesses. According to the bike riders, it has been difficult for them to survive. Time frame, just the cars have been, say, six to someone they did say 11 to 12, a gi another person will go throughout the night. But now you know they happen. Six to nine. We don't see and say the time frame, it don't affect to that side. The time frame is short for that side. Many people living along the coastal area survive on fishing. But due to the pandemic, there is a restriction on the number of boats to go out on fishing. Right now, we need to get way for support to family because the boats need to get a chance to do that. For long, we'll get. We will get to survive and we will come for manage where we family. Go buy the fish. We can the guy. He go sell by this hour. He don't buy. I left now 20, 30 dozen. He can't guy him. He pull him. He go sell him. Sell quick, quick. He get what he eat. It me begin them. But from from all going, I don't care now. Better not the fish not the. You not get outside have up again. But say we go buy. We can't get what we eat. Although business is not good. They were cold and all the day. But at the start for sale at 8 o'clock, till then 12 o'clock midnight. They sell the one bag for day. But from since we corona don't come, I need to sell each one bag self. And there are 20, 30 copper they sell. But what have they been doing in order to prevent themselves from the virus? If we can look now with junctions on side and day, we get uh, what about them? Hand sanitizer, some of food use hand sanitizer, some of food they wash with hand and they, they be, we be more than at Wazak Junction at the late checkpoint. Any bike where they pass to make sure they wash your hand. All they make. The advisor for give me the, the, the company there or tell them this face mask, let them use the face mask, the card in my face so. If you use the card in my face so, the card in my face so, properly wash it in my face so. Door number two. For avoid beaucoup crowd. I say this is not, but then take time. I forgot to wash the hand. Anything other than hand touch. Before you touch your face, wash your hand. Let me show you that there are way four people are in the can at the shop and they sit down at the table. But now two people are making this sit down. When they come for can eat, I, 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 I encourage them for letting them wash their hand before they can inside. The question is, what will be the future of the people when it's all over? Will it get better or remain the same?
Many thanks for, for, for that um, uh, very uh, interesting uh, perspective on what was happening in Freetown during the COVID pandemic. I will move over to uh, the next uh, session around community experiences. Uh, just checking if Sarah is now uh, in the house. We have uh, Sarah Nandudu from Uganda who will be followed by uh, Modesa Kapala from Malawi and Teresa Karapatana from the Philippines. Uh, you have between you uh, 20 minutes and uh, as I explained how you will see my head up when you are exceeding your time. Uh, over to you Sarah first. Thank you. Um, all right, thanks, Beth. We see your face and then you can mute, you can mute your video, Sarah, just so people have uh, a re reference point. Okay. Uh, am I seen? Sorry, I have a bit of, uh, I hope you get me. But that is the request that I take off the video because it will disturb me and since the network is not clear. You know, that's all right. At least we know who you are. <laughs> okay, thank you, Beth. And uh, I appreciate uh, this meeting to giving us an opportunity to share what we um, as as the National Slam Dance Federation of Uganda, we have been able to undertake a number of activities. One, the, 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 the discussion today, looking at locally made adaptations. For me, and bring it from bottom up, our process explains it all. Because our process is a bottom up approach. And while we are down there mobilizing communities, yes, we are doing it to bring people from the ground to raise them up. So our process alone, while we mobilize people into saving groups, we engage them to do small income generating activities, alone makes it uh, to be a bottom up approach. And the beauty about it is that we just don't sit to wait to be, to be given what we need. But at least we have solutions to our problems. And hence, uh, we only need people to support us to be able to carry them forward to the next level or for us to achieve what we intend to achieve. So as a network, through our savings, um, we've been able to do a number of activities and looking at how the climate is also affecting us and not leaving out COVID. After going through a terrible time of COVID times and having everything go down, as a federation, we came up with so many innovations as groups, because even when before COVID, what people had livelihood incomes, but COVID taught us that it's not enough. We needed to innovate around so many things to sustain ourselves, even when another epidemic comes in. So through the process of learning and exchange and sharing ideas, many of our groups have been able to undertake adaptation projects like uh, creating wealth within their means without even putting capital, where communities are unblocking their own drainages and are making a living out of the garbage that blocks the waste, the, the, the drainage system. And we had a chance recently to share in one of the, the meetings that the Cities Alliance organized here in Uganda, where we were sharing experiences on how we are adopting, creating innovations to be able to adopt to climate change issues. And we really saw that across SDI family, we are all doing the same things. And this means we are, we are engaging in two peer-to-peer -peer learning, which is a beauty about it. And through this, people have been able to earn a living through making waste, which is littering their settlements to wealth. We went and saw different groups doing a lot of briquettes. Briquettes is done from biodegradable waste, which people just dump in their communities and which waste again blocks the drainage channels, leading it to blocking the, the settlements and causing flooding. 
and then people are using uh, waste, which is polythene papers, wasted and thrown in drainage channels, but now they pick it up and make recycling, which is also earning a living. They are innovating around making the environment clean, uh, averting uh, flooding, but also earning a living out of it by recycling. And this has enabled them to create jobs, people earning through recycling. Those who bring waste to be sold to these groups are paid. Those who pick are paid. So within the same arrangement, people are recycling even their own savings to pay others as they earn. They also recycle to earn more money. This is one of the things we feel is so sustaining in communities because they're able to earn and then also make others get jobs. But besides that, we know that in our slum, we have contaminated waters due to low level of water. And once you dig deep, you fall into water. So you can't dig a pit latrine in such an environment. But through innovations, we've been able to put up sanitation blocks, which are climate friendly in such a way that people do not have to dig on the ground, but just make a channel or make a, a chamber where you just use worms. And the, the worms are used to eat your waste and then the waste is again generating manure, which is being utilized to, to, to put fertilizers in urban farming. So while you do this, you're responding to environmental protection by not contaminating the water, but at the same time, people are able to get a decent sanitation unit to use, which is a climate friendly, environmental friendly, as well as supporting them even and a livelihood. Because actually in Kampala, one of the, there's a lady who is rearing these worms and is able to sell them to other people to build this prototype of, of sanitation blocks. And to do this, ICT's Alliance also supported us to do under KJE, which is a big infrastructure project, are going to affect a number of wetlands. We try to showcase the sanitation units and committees have, by, have, have come to un accept it. However, the only challenge we need is to, to propel it, to, to make sure that we scale it up so that a wider range of communities take it up since it is environmentally friendly to each and everyone. But above all, this has created, uh, do I stop? Oh, it's a warning. Uh, okay, Beth. Why not? Yes, thanks, Sarah. All right. Thank you, Beth. Let me stop here then. All right. Thank you. Uh, sorry for the abrupt uh, um, stopping. I will just, when I lift my hand, I'm just asking you to summarize in the, so that you can, we can move on to the next person. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you, Sarah, for that. Um, can I move to Modesta from uh, Ka Kapala from Mal Malawi? Hello. Good morning, yes, everybody. Can hear you. Do you hear me? Yes, ah, okay. are you able to also put your video just briefly and then you can switch it off? Uh, it's off. Yes, I'm saying we just briefly so we can see you and then you can switch it off. It's difficult here. Okay, the then that's all right, Modesta. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name is Modesta Kapara from Malawi Federation. Uh, I want to start with the, let me say that nowadays in Malawi, it is not a surprise to hear of floods in the cities. Uh, poor access to land and housing for people in the informal settlement has resulted in people living in disaster prone areas. There are many people living in liver banks, as you can see in the pictures, in our pictures there, Due to poverty, many people who have run just build temporary structures which can all collapse easily. This problem is getting to too much due to COVID-19. So, so the Malawi Alliance realized that for sustainable transformation and indeed for sustainable building of urban resilience, there is no, there is need to build a critical mass of people. And this is what we do. We mobilize informal settlement residents 
to become aware of their problems and to start doing various actions in order to address the problems. We conduct meetings with governor, governance structures like <clears throat> what development committees, what civil protection committees, local chiefs and representatives of various ordinary groups of people. This includes women and the youth. We help them understanding their needs and to do this. We support communities to generate up-to-date community data for use in response and recovery. We do this through mapping and profiling processes. The information collected is used in community planning and prioritizing. The information is also used in negotiating for improvement in their service provisions. As you can see, the map are used as evidence when conducting meetings with local authorities, uh, even city councils, but also even when planning for local initiatives, which are mostly funded by local generated community development funds. Uh, the Malawi Alliance strongly believe in co production. We have therefore continued to enhance collaboration between communities and local government. This we do by facilitating the creation of platforms for meetings between the local people and local authorities and other services, other service providers. These meetings help the authorities to understand the pressing needs of people in, in the informal settlements. Uh, the meetings are also used to, to get ideas from the communities on how issues from their profile can be dealt with. The Marawa Alliance has partnership with the city councils, the Department of Disaster Management Affairs, and the Department of Urban Development under the Ministry of Lands and the Department of Environmental Affairs. We also work with other local and international NGOs like CCJP, Tiltose Foundation, UN, UN Habitant, Concern Universal, and others. We are currently piloting a slum upgrading project. Uh, the Malawi Alliance strongly believe that we cannot walk, talk about building resilience in the absence of actions to improve people's livelihoods. We continue to emphasize of, on promet, promoting race climate dependent, dependent and non-climate dependent livelihoods diversification. To date, over 500 communities members and mainly from 18 Federation Savings Group and the majority who are women have benefited with key skills, such as tailoring, designing, shoemaking, tie and dye, sausage making, mushroom farming, and making peanuts. They are also trained in entrepreneurship and financial literacy skills. The Malawi Alliance now has the Zamanja Skills Cooperative. This group and members involved in various arts and craft. The, co the cooperative will be formalized soon and will be access credit and other opportunities. The Malawi Alliance has supported, supported well, communities could you, to set up. Could you, could you wind up? Uh, we we paint the program too much and uh, we, we would like to give others an opportunity. If you could summarize it, yeah. Ah, okay, the Malawi Alliance also is piloting nature-based solutions and urban biodiversity actions in the context of informal settlement upgrading and climate change resilience. We support communities to restore vegetation, uh, e.g. tree planting. We support communities sustainably managed waste proper disposal. We also promote compost manure production, and this is an income generating activity. We also support communities to formulate by laws and on protection of their environment. They are also uh, locally enforced and they are right in line with the city by laws. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Modesta. Can we move to Teresa? And um, I apologize for, for rushing you all. Good afternoon, good morning. I'm Teresa from the Philippines. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? 
We can hear you, Teresa. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I'm turning off my camera so that um, my signal won't be uh, affected. Okay, so um, so I would like to present uh, the initiatives of the Homeless People's Federation Philippines um, uh, during the pandemic and also um, other initiatives uh, that um, provides you information about how we as a network um, is um, oper oper uh, operationalizing the, the uh, local and that adaptation. So just for context, um, uh, the Federation is an organized uh, groups of 102 communities and 258 savings groups um, operating in the Philippines um, major islands. So those dots that you see are the, the, the uh, places that we are um, of, uh, uh, we have active savings groups. So we have community savings, uh, citywide. Uh, we uh, undertake citywide mapping and community led, uh, community -led land acquisition projects. Um, so uh, these uh, initiatives um, is really focusing on uh, how the communities can be safe, can transfer to safe places during uh, flooding, during um, cyclones and other um, calamities. So during the lockdown, which was uh, in 20, um, March 2020, um, of course, you you will uh, you may have you may have known that uh, the Philippines had the longest lockdowns in the history of COVID. Yeah, so um, uh, these uh, lockdowns are not just uh, for us not not a health risk issue, but a death death sentence to the communities because um, these lockdowns, quarantine, social distancing um, just exas exacerbated or magnified the poverty and inequities that we experience. Uh, these measures imposed to contain the spread of COVID-19 resulted to loss of jobs, livelihood, particularly among the informals, the vendors, um, tricycle drivers, and this loss of income um, increased the food insecurity affecting uh, particularly children and elderly. So, um, yeah, and also the situation in these communities, especially with no adequate services before COVID-19 just worsened, uh, access to clean water and reliable power. So, uh, Along with the lockdown, the social distancing, distancing protocols also contributed to problems in mental health and increase in the uh, gender-based violence among families. Yeah, so we conducted, uh, to, to address these issues, we conducted um, community mapping uh, as basis for responding to the needs of the most vulnerable. So these dots are the uh, COVID uh, positive people that uh, the communities are, uh, you know, warned that they should not, you know, uh, they should uh, practice um, health protocols so that they will be affect. Uh, they won't. They can. Uh, they can be safe to uh, to the virus. Um, others, we conduct, we had community kitchens to address hunger, food scarcity. Uh, led by uh, the communities themselves. Um, we also responded, uh, the communities also helped in responding using uh, wash facilities initiated by community to, to, as part of COVID prevention, um, education campaign, minimum health protocols. Um, we also, um, distributed um, health monitoring um, uh, provisions, supplies, PPEs, and others. Um, 
the pandemic also worsened the the mental health issues of the of the people in the community, especially during the long lockdowns, and uh, of course the issues of uh, uh, that just make the their uh, experiences as poor people become more um, uh, worsened, just worsened. So we conducted webinars for mental health uh, to support uh, the communities who have um, exhibited symptoms of you know, depression and other mental issues. Um, this pandemic, uh, we have shown that, and we have learned that the communities are self-organizing. Self um, so, um, there were urban farmings that was uh, initiated by the communities to improve the food security with close coordination with the government agencies. And right now we have um, three or four cities that have, um, have promising um, uh, results in this in, uh, intervention. So we also use the waste materials from the community to um, um, to uh, help in help cleaning up the environment and more so um, help in, the, uh, in dealing with climate change and other uh, issues. Lessons learned. Um, we have um, realized in this full pandemic that um, people with uh, organized communities have uh, bigger chances in surviving the, uh, the climate impacts, uh, impacts of disasters. Um, we also learned that uh, we have to, we have, uh, as, a, as a network, we ha really have to establish uh, and um, improve our gender, uh, gender mainstreaming uh, uh, program. Um, we have established a, a more robust uh, monitoring systems and that uh, as a community, um, those who are more um, organized, have uh, bigger chances in um, uh, setting up a more uh, meaningful relationship and partnership with their LGUs and uh, local government units. Um, so uh, for us, uh, implementing locally led adaptation in in different contexts, in context of disasters, pandemic, and all other risks. Um, the, the approach of the network, which is really uh, using the, the social capital of the people in the, on the ground to, um, to, build, uh, to build something for themselves and be part of the solution and uh, address in addressing their issues, those people who have the the best Thank information. You. Thank yeah. you, Teresa. I'm sorry to cut you. Um, we yeah. Could you just uh, finalize? Yeah. So. Um, Thank you also for giving us a chance to participate in this event. And um, thank you for hearing the voice of the urban poor in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, again, I apologize uh, for, for this very brutal way of uh, uh, moderating, but we, we tried to pay too much into this process. Um, uh, and I would like to ensure that we have some time to also engage with uh, our audience. Uh, could we move forward to Francis uh, and uh, Rafael from Sierra Leone, as well as Ivan Banana from Zimbabwe, to talk through their case studies uh, 
uh, in implementing locally led adaptation in urban informal settlements. Uh, and Francis and, uh, and uh, Evans, you each have about uh, seven minutes each. Uh, so please, uh, I will be more brutal with you. <laughs> Over to you, Francis. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Francis Refu, the founder and directly, director for Center of Dialogue on Human Settlement and Poverty Elevation. Uh, yeah. Please, next slide. So I uh, thank to the Secretariat and Cities Alliance for organizing the session. Uh, can we go? Okay, great. So uh, quickly, uh, what I'm going to talk about, I'll just give an introduction to Kurosapa and Federation. We just quickly run through the LLA principle. So my presentation is actually uh, picking on each, each uh, LLA principle and what is happening around that. Then uh, I'll give just a roundup on lessons learned. Next slide, please. Great, of course, Kurosapa actually started in 2011 and I've been providing support to the Federation. So as a matter of fact, as a professional supporting office, it's uh, actually younger than the Federation that actually started uh, with the Sierra YMC, then Kurosapa inherited it and started giving support. So of course, we know the Federation, what happens, mobilizing around savings and establishing a voice and a platform for uh, engaging with uh, um, duty bearers. Next slide, please. All right, so quickly the principles here, uh, uh, I think it's really broad from my side. Uh, please let me just open my screen. So my presentation here, it's basically broad from your end on the screen. All right, so uh, the principle quickly, a principle in involving decision-making to the lowest appropriate level, addressing structural inequalities faced by women, youth, children, disabled and displaced people, and indigenous peoples and marginalized ethnic groups, providing patient and predictable funding that can be accessed more easily, investing in local capabilities to leave an institutional legacy, uh, building a robust understanding of climate risk and uncertainty, flexible programming and learning, ensuring transparency and accountability and uh, collaborative action. So I have to be reading so that I go a little bit fast from uh, my presentation I've opened here. Uh, the early actions, the first principle, what is going around that? Uh, we have established a community a learning platform and a city learning platform. Actually, this provide a democratic space as, at, at community level and a multi-stakeholder inclusive platform at the city level. So communities uh, in the community learning platform discuss issues that uh, that borders around their their safety and you know their 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 protection and their livelihoods and those discussions are taken to the city learning platform which actually hosts a, a number of uh, state and non-state actors, both at local and at, at, as well as the state level. And so those issues from the community are discussed at that platform. Also, um, uh, communities have been given the opportunity through FEDOP to be represented in a national habitat committee, which is actually a nascent uh, committee that uh, is being uh, supported by uh, the UN Habitat to, to uh, uh, develop an urban uh, plan for the country. And so FEDOP now is part of that committee. And of course, uh, FEDOP was given, the Federation was given the opportunity to actually participate in the development of the Transform uh, Freetown Agenda by way of organizing a NICE, uh, um, NICE assessment uh, through focus group discussions. Uh, the next LLA, which is addressing structural inequalities, um, the communities, federation, and the communities have organized uh, themselves uh, through uh, the gender equality and social inclusion program in which um, uh, embraces uh, participation of, or trying to promote participation of 
people with disability, women and youth, you know, in all aspects of the uh, development uh, aspiration of the communities. Uh, currently, uh, they are also involved in uh, organizing and trying to really promote a robust uh, 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 inclusion, financial inclusion of women living in informal settlements. This is a project that is actually implemented in partnership with the Restless Development, which is an international youth-led program. And so this is encouraging more young people, people with disability, but more focus on women, you know, across the generational uh, uh, spectrum, you know, and so uh, it is really pushing more in terms of strengthening financial inclusion of those uh, uh, cohorts that have been marginalized when it comes to financial uh, opportunities. Also, uh, what we have done is uh, to enhance more protection is uh, we have rolled out our safeguarding uh, through our partnership with the CRS, uh, safeguarding uh, policy and practices across, you know, all the communities that we are, we are working in so that um, communities will be conscious of what it means, you know, to provide safeguarding for uh, the vulnerable in communities. Uh, now, Francis. All right, great. Okay, so the next principle is uh, providing patient and predictable. Of course, we are doing daily savings, urban poor fund, to what we call locally for, for the Bambai Trust. So, we, we, the, the federation is building a capital and attract, you know, uh, trying to attract a, a higher level contribution to an urban poor fund that will be able to finance uh, their initiatives and aspirations. The other one is investing in local capabilities uh, to leave an influential. So you see uh, that in fact, uh, there are a lot of capacity building for the federation to be able to provide leadership for themselves and be able to participate you know, at local as well as high level engagement processes, which for example, the uh, national chair of the federation was part of the International uh, uh, Water Association, uh, uh, World Water Congress and Exhibition early in the middle of this year, sorry. And of course we know how the federation, you know, as a very grassroots level actually sits on the SDI council, you know, and so. Uh, we also have like, uh, doing a research where communities drive, you know, uh, data collection surveys and, and research work analysis, you know, to give actually a community voice. So you see how communities are given that space so that uh, some level of institutional legacy is built. Uh, the other one is building a robust understanding of climate. So a lot of action is going on within communities to ensure climate risk, you know, to address climate risk and uncertainty. One, we have mobilized CDMCs across informal settlements, which we are moving towards, not just as responders, but being robust as community story, as climate change uh, action ambassadors, you know, and so they are involved currently with, in, the, in, the, in the initiative of the Freetown City Council, which is, which is the hashtag uh, Freetown, the tree town. They are the, the drivers, the key drivers of planting and growing and tracking of those trees that are being planted to ensure uh, community resilience. Uh, we are also conducting uh, a lot of research and building capacities of the local communities so that you know, they, they, they own up the process, but also have the capacity to be able to respond to their needs. Also doing a lot of data collection in areas of risk mapping and, and risk and hazard mapping so that the communities get informed you know, and be able to, to address their issues. Uh, the, the other last one, uh, sorry, the other one is flexible programming. Of course, this is the downside of things, you know, not much has been done, even though we are trying to build a local uh, urban poor fund, but we have not been able to successfully attract, you know, contributions, you know, uh, uh, in terms of funding that will be flexible in programming and in learning. Most of them are straight jacket and actually very restricted. Uh, the other one, ensuring transparency. Of course, we know the, our systems, even our fed up chairman here, federation chairman sits on the Kodosapa board because we want to ensure transparency for the people. You know, uh, um, they were involved in developing the transform free time from the very beginning. So they know and keep track of what is going on. And they, we partner together with local 
we, we, we ensure that we establish a platform where communities and, and city authorities and even state authorities sit together to co-create solutions through consultations. Uh, the last I'm sorry, we have to... All right, All right. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, I understand, of course, the presentation is available. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope in the discussion we'll have time to finish on what we didn't say much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, again, I apologize for cutting those, these very interesting uh, uh, presentations are short. Uh, Evans, uh, you have six minutes. Uh, so could you please, yeah, really try and uh, keep to the time? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Beth. Uh, my name is Ivan Tai Banana from uh, Dialogue and Short uh, SDI uh, Zimbabwe. So uh, my presentation will mainly focus on the uh, instrumentality of uh, city funds that are being uh, created in partnership between the urban poor and the city authorities. Of course, we have uh, three in Zimbabwe, but I just selected one. Next slide, please. So I just tried to provide a bit of uh, context uh, in terms of what uh, actually is influencing uh, the creation of these uh, city funds. I think mainly in the issue of the legality status that is mostly placed on informal settlements and how is that is continuously being used to exclude informal uh, settlements, urban uh, development. Um, and also, I think at a national level, there are a number of progressive policies that are being created, mainly targeting climate change issues, but there's a disconnect to the local uh, level. The idea is how do we transform or translate the policies into practice? Then I also try to summarize what I thought would be key drivers uh, of vulnerability, mainly targeting uh, the informal uh, settlements. I think to start with is the unemployment, that is driving poverty issues, then the informality itself. Local authorities mostly see the physical, spatial aspects and totally ignore the social and the settlers that uh, live in these uh, settlements. Then the environmental sensitive locations where informality is mostly prevalent, uh, lack of social cohesion mainly in some of the informal uh, uh, settlements, then lack of state social security, uh, concentrate of evictions that is also driving issues of um, exclusion. Next slide, please. Um, then there's a picture that is just showing one of the informal settlements in Zimbabwe where there was Banse Road, but now it is transformed into a gully. Next slide. Uh, the next slide is talking about uh, the grassroots responses to these gaps that have been noted at national and um, uh, local levels. So the communities have organized themselves into certain schemes. Uh, Zimbabwe Homeless Post Federation have um, spearheaded that. And uh, through the mobilized savings groups, they've created what is known uh, as a Gungano Open Poor Fund, 100% uh, um, owned and managed by the communities. Um, its main uh, utility is to empower poor communities and we mostly used to leverage more resources from the local authorities and other partners. And uh, through that uh, established social cohesion, the community have been able to conduct community-led informal settlement profiles and then use the data to engage uh, the decision makers. So from that social cohesion point of view, they have quite a number of adaptation response action that have been taken to date. Uh, again, the law is a summary, but I doubt people will be able to see it. And then the first one, obviously, is the building of social cohesion, then the conducting of settlement profiles, then investing in settlement in a relationship rather with local uh, authorities through exchanges and um, a number of interactions with the local authorities. Then again, uh, the innovative technologies um, that are being introduced by the communities and in Mashingo. There is the ecological sanitation toilets, and then the drilling of bores and installation of piped water schemes as a way of also augmenting water supply. Then uh, the small scale livelihood energy and construction loans that is supporting mainly the grassroots vulnerable communities. And uh, all that has led to the creation of the Mashingo uh, CCT fund. And it was a process that once the community now is the capacity, they then engage the local authority to co um, 
own what is known as Mashingo uh, CCT fund. Next slide, please. Um, so I just tried to provide a summary of um, Mashingo City Fund. The partners, they are Zimbabwe Women's Sports Federation, Mashingo City, and Dialogue on Shelter. Um, in terms of ownership, it's funded by, it's co owned, co governed by all the partners. The designing of products, uh, loans product, is constantly being reviewed to do a kind of reflect the emerging issues. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility. Then the main objective is to try to prioritize upgrading a livelihood loan so that they target the most vulnerable. Then again, there's a summary of what the fund has managed to do to date. It started with a seed capital of 20,000 in 2021, and to date it has benefited uh, 1,252, of which 96% are women. And then the fund has grown in total to over 1,700, 175,000 uh, USD. Um, then there's another picture which is also showing um, some of the use of the savings by the local uh, communities. Then I just try to summarize what um, the local leader adaptation principles and how the city fund and the Kungano fund are trying to be used by the communities in trying to achieve that. Then the first one, uh, building of a strong grassroots voice. So obviously the social cohesion Beyond the federation membership, federation in Mashingo, they've also mobilized the citywide uh, urban poor uh, to form solidarity groups and then create platforms where they occasionally meet and discuss issues that are bedeviling in their communities. Um, and then the profiles that are also community led, they've been used to call for meetings and then presented to decision makers and then also used to engage for the improvement of their own communities. Um, in addition to building a strong voice, the community also has moved on to uh, addressing structural inequalities. Because I think there is a realization that in as much as we continue to do pilots, but if the structural issues are not addressed, uh, it will continue to be on a piecemeal and pilot level. So the communities, uh, through the creation of the city fund, the idea then is how can we sit on the negotiating table with the local government and then discuss issues of development. That way it will not continuously exclude informal settlements, but rather include them when in the development discourse. So obviously the inclusion of informal settlement, and then it also offered a good avenue then of then con having a conversation around slum upgrading uh, in a non-threatening manner. Whereas uh, before the city fund, the uh, communities would then come individually, but through a city fund, it offers that uh, institu institutional platform to discuss that. Then there's also understanding- uh, advance, I'm doing that. Uh, then there's yeah. also <laughs> understanding climate risk and um, uncertainty that the, the periodic um, uh, community risk assessment mainly captures issues of uh, climate change risk and how they can be also addressed. Then lastly, uh, the collaborative action and um, investment, um, mainly the co-production of data and then identification of uh, interventions by the parties involved with the community and the local authorities themselves. And then the contribution by the city in the funds, uh, not only addressing the issues um, from the city side, but uh, having a conversation and collectively agreeing on the priorities, drawing more uh, contribution from the uh, informal settlements. Then I just attempted uh, to put on gaps that are being noted uh, as we are doing the work. Then obviously there is um, a lack of access to climate uh, change finance. And then the framing of national policies currently they are divorced from local action and uh, not also recognizing the capacities that are inherent in those communities. Thank you, Beth. Thank you very much, Evans, and uh, um, thank you to all our presenters. Uh, I think that's a like a, a rich array of uh, experiences and uh, very interesting insights as well as uh, practice on the ground. Um, I'll, I'll now uh, move on to our partners. We, as I introduced before, we have Mr. Abdul Karim 
Marath, who is a development planning officer in Freetown City Council, and Miss Julian Baskin uh, from the Cities Alliance. Uh, what we would like to, to ask from you, gentlemen, and starting with Julian, is what have you, if your experience has been that is unique in terms of our working uh, with uh, community, uh, organized communities such as those represented here by the SDI affiliates. Uh, we hoping you have about um, 20 minutes or 10 minutes each in the hope that we can catch up a bit on time and uh, be able to give um, an opportunity to our audience. Over to you, G Julian. All right, thank you so much, Beth. Can you hear me first of all? Perfect. Um, what an amazing array of experiences. And the very, very first thing that comes to my mind is that there was a time when data was the primary purpose of SDI. People would go into communities, collect data, and data in of itself became everything. What I'm seeing here is that we've now moved from data to real action on the ground using that data to get things done, organizing people to make, to make a difference. So there's a, a, a real maturity in, in what is being done on the ground. The key message from my side is something along these lines. And it's not a great message. You know, the message from me is that the world is becoming increasingly complex. Um, there is less and less consensus as to what needs to be done in this world. There, there is an enormous amount of politicization and falsehood and opportunism um, in, the sort of, in the prevailing sort of political context um, in which we work. And all that all sums up to me is that in a complete, in an environment that is going to be changing and, and, and we can talk about climate change in that context. The world will change in almost every possible way. And I think that communities, if they are not organized, will be forgotten. Um, the idea that someone from outside is going to come to the rescue is simply coming less and less likely as we go forward and as every country starts to face a whole array of, of of their own crises uh, and their own distractions. So I think the very, very point, the first point I want to make is someone from Malawi uh, made a comment about the need for critical mass. Absolutely, the, the, the agenda has to move towards making sure that in every one of the seven, and I'm just talking about Africa here, and I know that, there, that we have people from the Philippines and from, from Asia, but I think it's pretty much the same thing. You know, I think that in every one of the 7,000 or so towns that exist in, 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 in Africa, 7,000 7, cities in Africa, we have to make sure that there is some form of organization of the urban poor. Someone who is able to, to talk with trust. Now, the second point, which was made, I think made from the, by the person from Zimbabwe, critical mass is one thing, trusted leadership is the other. If you have critical mass and you have trusted leadership, you set the platform to be completely transformative. And what I've seen of SDI at the moment and the work that's happening is that there's progress on both those fronts, but both those fronts need to accelerate. We need to be de developing a wider spread, but also a deeper, um, a deeper leadership structure right down into into the grassroots. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is increasingly the person who gives the message is the most important person. If the wrong person is giving the message, people simply do not believe it. You can only, for example, imagine what's happening in much of, of, of the Northern context where people simply don't believe climate change because they don't believe the interests who are telling them about climate change. Um, they don't believe uh, much of what is said. There's always a counter narrative for almost anything that takes place. So the future is really going to depend 
on people from within the community who are trusted by the community, who are exposed to the real issues, uh, both globally all the way down to locally, who can transmit a message to the community and be trusted that that, that, that message doesn't reflect any other agenda other than the interests of the urban poor. And I, what I'm seeing in, in many of the presentations is precisely that, but I'm just putting into words what I think needs to be, is the bigger agenda around, around this. Now, it seems, it, it seems to me that um, when it comes to, when it came to COVID and, and, and the pandemic, it was a pandemic, and at the time when um, there was no vaccine, there was an enormous amount of interest by the global north, by, 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 the, by the international donors, etc., to make sure that the pandemic didn't spread. Why? Because they had a strong vested interest at that time. But the moment that vaccines became available, the moment vaccines became available and they could protect themselves against the pandemic and the worries uh, uh, began to subside a bit, you know, then that interest sort of <laughs> died down quite substantially, which reminds me very much of, of, of historically. Historically, you know, there's, all, there's always been cities. You can go to the most ancient uh, ruins of this world and you'll find that in every one of those ancient cities, there always were water and sanitation systems in the poorest areas of ancient cities. And then as we go into the modern world, we discover that the poor areas don't have water and they don't have sanitation. What changed? What changed was there was a time when the rich completely depended on the poor, uh, the health of the poor for their own health. If a poor person got sick because of bad sanitation, disease was spread directly to the rich. But once with the advent of antibiotics, et cetera, and, and, and health facilities, people got less concerned about that and they forgot about the interests of the poor. So why am I saying this? I'm saying that I think we have to start building a consciousness amongst cities and amongst people generally that development is going to be as local as possible and that people have to be equipped for the future. And the way to be equipped for the future is to make sure that you understand the future, you understand those challenges and you gear up for them. And, and for me, the starting point is a very basic starting point. The starting point is for everyone to understand where they are at the moment, where they want to go in the future, what strategies they will adopt to get there and what leadership they're gonna to need to take them there. And I see that type of planning happening throughout SDI. And I think that puts SDI uh, in all the federations in a very strong position to start spreading this agenda because without, without this agenda, Communities simply won't be able to defend themselves against climate change. I think, um, and just a final comment, I know I'm running um, out of time a little bit and, and, and best getting, getting a, bit, uh, a bit agitated. You know, I think that our cities are still growing. Um, they, they, uh, and I think that there's still time to make sure that, we may, that a great deal of planning at the local level happens to make sure that people settle minimally in the right place. Even if we don't have detailed sites uh, planned, uh, minimally then people must settle in the future in places that don't impact on the natural ecosystems of the city and, don't, uh, and aren't obviously areas that are hazardous going for, uh, forward. So I think one of the agendas that needs to take place at the local level is, is engaging with the long-term city strategy to make sure that when people do come to the city, when the city expands, as, as all the cities are expanding, they expand in a way that doesn't play into the disaster of climate change, but helps people to adapt to climate change by having people on, on safer land. So just my final comment is, I, I sense from these presentations today that there's been a huge amount of progress it's a progress from understanding no city uh, was, the, was the campaign when it started to actually doing actions in your city uh, to make sure that the cities become more uh, resilient going forward. Thank you, just for those words. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Julian. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for, for those very insightful uh, responses to the presentation. 
Um, I would like to move over to Mr. Abdul Karim Mara. Um, and uh, as with um, my question to Julian, uh, I would like to just uh, find from you what you found is unique in uh, your working with uh, the uh, Federation and uh, Kodasapa in Freetown. And how do you think uh, that le local level of local organizing um, helps in uh, the implementation of uh, locally led adaptation work. Um, over to you, uh, Mr. Mara. Thank you very much for having me. Um, we all believe that while most cities are shrinking, many urban centers are seen rapid and largely uncontrolled population growth, creating a pattern of urbanization. Most of this growth is now taking place in developing countries and is concentrated in informal settlement and slums. Therefore, the very urban areas that are growing faster are also those that are least equipped to deal with the threat of climate change. Having said that, the Fed up, Kurosapa has been supporting the Freetown City Council in diverse ways for the past 20 years. As a council, we believe if we were to address community aspiration adequately, we must work with civil societies who are more closer to the people. Because in the past, Distribution of services has been from the top directly to the community. We are in there, we are a lot of leakages. But with the coming in of the local council and working with local NGOs who are operating directly with these communities, it has helped us tremendously in addressing community needs and also have helped us to address these needs by way of how they should be addressed in a prioritized manner. FedUp has been engaged with Freetown City Council or Freetown City Council has been collaborating with FedUp in community enumeration. We've been also working together to develop the Transform Freetown plan. Of course, wherein we saw their relevance doing what we call the needs assessment and eventually the needs were prioritized. And also, they were engaged or involved in community kitchen in informal settlement during the COVID-19 lockdowns. We know the impact of climate change and we believe if we were to address the impact of climate change, a lot need to be done, especially in Freetown where the speed of uncontrolled development has taken place, which has led to the cutting down of trees. And if we were to address the problem of flooding, there is a lot need to be done by way of growing trees. So the Fed Up has also been working with Freetown City Council, hashtag Prampon Freetown, the Tree Town, to restore mangroves in many, many areas. Urban farming in 10 informal settlements. Saving practices create the opportunity to promote financial inclusion. Having said that, the value found in all this includes it eases community entry and engagement for FCC and partners. It also creates and organized structures to engage communities, build bridges between council and the settlement, generate better understanding and insight of community dynamics, and also enhance community ownership because we believe if the community are adequately involved in development process, they will take ownership of whatever comes, happens to be the outcome. And that we, we believe will lead to sustainability and also address community felt needs. It also lays the foundation for leaving no one behind that failure will, that fulfills the inclusive city agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, and uh, thank you for, for keeping to the time as well uh, and, and for those very insightful comments as well as uh, a reflection of just how the work of uh, the Kodasapa and uh, the uh, 
Sierra Leone Federation uh, aligns uh, with the aspirations uh, of uh, the Freetown City Council. Um, we have uh, come to the end of our presentations and uh, we have uh, 20 minutes where we would like to have a discussion, um, take questions from the floor, as well as ask our, our panelists uh, to, to make additional comments. Uh, I have sort of like a three key questions um, related to the presentations. And then I'll also look at the chat box to see if we have additional questions. So, um, one of the questions uh, relates to from what do you think is required for com of communities and other stakeholders uh, to to bring scale to the work that we we has been presented here um, it would be really good to to have a, a a conversation around that and then we had uh, i saw a question in the chat related to the role of faith-based organizations is, um, and, and also a question around what is uh, perceived as uh, uh, external hand-holding, uh, perhaps uh, our, uh, our uh, audience member, I think it's Jaganata, could, could elaborate on, 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 on that point. Uh, so, and then also, how do, does meaningful partnership with organized urban community increase the impact of uh, locally led adaptation work? I think from both J Julian and um, uh, Abdul's uh, uh, interventions, we have seen just how uh, uh, the linkages between um, uh, development partners as well as uh, city authorities, how what they see is uh, the potential um, and linkages and uh, the, the increase in impact of these partnerships. So those are kind of like uh, the framing questions. Um, any one of our partners uh, or participants and uh, our presenters, you're very welcome to, uh, to answer to, to those questions. Thank you. I'll, uh, with your show of hands, um, I can ask people to come in. I had um, someone with iPhone, iPhone XR in the hand up earlier and I asked them to, to put their uh, intervention in the chat box, but I haven't seen it. Uh, Teresa, Evans, um, Francis, any responses to some of the questions that have been raised? Yes, uh, Francis. Okay, thank you very much, Beth. Uh, maybe I will take on the first one that talks about what is required for communities and uh, other partners to bring scale to what is presented here. I think, um, there has to be a deliberate um, an action, particularly for the local and state institutions to prioritize uh, the needs of uh, people living in slums and informal settlements. Uh, oftentimes, um, while we, not excluding myself, while we are planning for the city, it is mostly about beautiful roads in the already formalized areas, electricity and water so that, you know, if you like the, uh, the middle class or the aristocrats will have to have the service with little or no consideration for the poor. But looking at the Freetown context um, <clears throat> through our uh, citywide profile in which uh, together with the FCC, that we agreed that there are about 68 to 72 informal settlements, which actually constitute uh, 35 to 40 percent of the Freetown population. I guess that is a huge uh, critical mass. And so if uh, there is no deliberate action to address the needs of those localities, then <clears throat> it means our government or our systems is deliberately ignoring 
four, 35 to 40% of the residents of Freetown. So I think there has to be. But over and above that is that already communities are making effort. So in terms of prioritizing, the, the state, the local and state actors should really recognize the role that these people are playing, you know, in terms of uh, ensuring that, um, you know, that the, their lives are, are secured, that their communities are, are resilient. Out of their meager resources, out of their desperate situation, they are working hard to actually find solutions. So I think state actors, local actors should really capitalize on those uh, potential, on those opportunities to really to bring to scale. You know, as I mentioned uh, um, earlier on that, um, like the Federation is building the urban poor fund called it for the Bambai Trust. For the Bambai is actually a crew or meaning for the future. So which means these people have been futuristic and they are calling on government to say, partner with us. If we're able to pull our resources together, you bring in what you have and we, we have what we got will be able to, to actually bring to scale or to be able to address a lot of the issues that government is, is grappling with. But unfortunately, I often ask this question that really states, local private sectors, no one wants to do business with the poor, but then they are failing to realize that in, in the midst of that poverty, there are huge potential, you know, amidst the people that if it is well harnessed, I mean, miracles in quotes will really happen. Uh, out of the situation. Thank so, you, Francis. Um, <laughs> uh, just so we have uh, an opportunity for others to 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 respond. Uh, anyone else uh, from the from our panelists and our responders uh, to the questions that are posed on the screen, and um, also from the audience. Uh, I think um, there is. Uh, a Nigerian experience that has also been uh, put in the chat. Uh, good to hear from the work that the Nigerians have also done around uh, COVID and climate over this uh, very difficult period. Anyone else from our panelists who would like to comment? Uh, hello, good morning. Um, I'm from Nigerian Federation. Um, I think we've been working uh, seriously with the government and university, and uh, we are grateful, especially the uh, Lasura Lagos State Resilience uh, Office, uh, Lasro, Lasro. So they've been working um, with the university, with the Nigerian Federation. We've been having series of meetings, and these meetings have been fruitful because we've been seeing the impacts in our communities, uh, like I chatted in the box. Uh, communities that have been flooded. Uh, we've had uh, governments from the uh, from agent from the government agencies coming in with their bulldozers, trying to come and help us pack the canals and their work on the drainages. So there is actually reduction in the aspect of flooding in some communities. And on our own side, as a federation, we've been able to get seeds and uh, plants in some communities across the waterfront, where we know uh, those things are very useful. And uh, we are presently working on a project with some individuals from the university too, who are helping to register children in school for those parents that lost their means of livelihood since the time of the lockdown. Their children have not been able to go back to school. So they are giving us uh, funds. We are paying for registration, school uniforms, and we are getting books for them also. And Thank it's you, also Rachel. happening. Thank you yes. very much uh, for that uh, intervention. Um, there is also another hand from our panelists. Uh, Evans, uh, would you like to come in um, related to the questions, uh, um, how meaningful partnerships uh, help and what we can do to scale up? Over to you, Evans. Uh, thank you, Beth. I think for me, it all goes down to how we are identifying our problem, whether I think as yes, the communities and the local government, we do have a shared position. I think in as much as we lack that consensus, there's bound to be that uh, fight to convince uh, each other and asking counter uh, justification to just to propose certain um, action. So I think the first issue is then to identify what are those structural barriers that are 
kind of further excluding the involvement of those communities into um, uh, negotiations uh, uh, with the um, local uh, government. So I think the uh, idea of co-producing data from informal settlements is a good starting point because uh, both the local government and the communities will be part of that process and uh, hopefully they will see the challenges from a common point of view and then the generation of solutions will also be from that uh, same angle. This, uh, the critical mass that has been already registered by the communities is also uh, something that uh, the communities will continuously mobilize uh, the citywide uh, communities. In Mashingo uh, example, there is uh, the resilience platforms which the community of Mashingo have started with the local authority where also other non-governmental state actors and also some of the government agencies. It's a non-threatening platform where these partners also come and have a conversation drawing uh, inputs from uh, each other. I think that's my input in terms of how we can scale up the current pilots. Thank you. Um, Teresa, Sarah, um, from, from your perspective as uh, federation uh, leaders uh, working on the ground, where do you see the bottlenecks being and uh, uh, what do you see as a um, uh, what is required in order to scale up the work that you've done in the successful work that you have done. Um, then we also have uh, a question directed at Malawi, uh, at the Malawi Federation, uh, where they would like to know more about waste management. Is it possible for them to explain more on the daily routine in waste management and also the challenges they are facing? So uh, is it Modesta? Modesta is a direct question to you. And then I'm also challenging Teresa and uh, Sarah to, to respond to the questions that are on the, uh, on the platform. Thank you. Perhaps Modesta first and then Sarah and, uh, and uh, Teresa. You are muted, Modesta. Yeah. Hi. Hello, <clears throat> I just want to respond to the question that would like to know about the waste management. Here in, Mal in Malawi cities, uh, this, our city councils don't correct the waste. So as the results, we, we organized women from federation and others from non-federation members to correct the waste from different houses and put it together and to make the manure. So as we are doing this, during this pandemic, we also have the opportunity to do business of waste management because we do, we, we make manure through that waste. So people are selling the, those manure to the farmers, to even to the houses that have gardens, that have flowers, that have gardens for the weddings, they buy us. We have a company that called Four Seasons. We have a contract with them. They came to us as federation to make an agreement so that they can buy from us. So we have different, in different cities that we are doing this and we are making a lot of money. And also in our groups, we have money to save in our savings in federation. That is what we are doing, correct the waste from homes and make manure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Modesta. Sarah and uh, Teresa, any additional comments? Ariana, I can't really see um, the rest of the for, um, yes, Swa Swati so has it. her hand up, um, okay. and then and Teresa and Jagannatha also okay. also do. So maybe so maybe we could start with uh, Teresa, then we move on to Swati and uh, um, the last person you mentioned. I for some reason I can't see people's hands. 
Um, so over to you, Teresa. And we just have six minutes before we- Hello. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a question. What is required of the communities and other stakeholders in order to replicate and scale up this work? Actually, we have shown uh, as a network, uh, SDI and um, the affiliates in different countries have in more than two decades have shown a proof of concept of how can a community of an urban poor can make a difference and uh, be part of the solution. But uh, actually the limitations really is that um, um, the, the, um, the resources is limited in the hands of the poor. So that's why um, uh, even though we have good partnerships, we have uh, uh, meaningful partnerships with government, with uh, academe, with uh, and other stakeholders, um, the magnitude of the problem uh, and the, uh, the, the changing environment, uh, the mortal hazard, uh, uh, you know, um, mortal hazard uh, uh, situation that our communities are in right now really, um, requires um, investment from the government and from uh, other sectors so that these initiatives that are shown here can be replicated and can be scaled up in a more sustainable and a more uh, effective manner. Uh, I think that's one. Um, uh, with you, regard you, Teresa, sorry, Teresa, we... We have four minutes and we want to to okay thank you yeah. Yeah. okay thank, thank you. you very much uh swati uh uh a minute <laughs> hi beth we go to jaganata yeah hi beth hi ariana hi everybody else um so i'm swati um i have been working with sci for the last two years so i know this group very well um, thank you so much for the great presentation. I actually have a question for Teresa because we work a lot in Africa and South Asia, but not too much in East Asia uh, during COVID. Um, and so uh, Teresa, I really wanted to understand, you know, this amazing um, uh, sort of innovation that was triggered by COVID, you know, including urban agriculture, um, to tackle the food insecurity and, and to, you know, deal with the crisis response. Uh, did it change, uh, did it bring about any change you, uh, with, you know, in terms of your relationship with the city, um, you know, in terms of uh, the institutional arrangement that you had with the city, you know, uh, now that they are aware that you, got, you know, the Federation was instrumental in pandemic response, um, ha have you seen more uptick in terms of, ha you know, collecting this community level data um, and including, you know, collecting data on climate? Um, and, and that's something I want to understand, you know, uh, because it's not so standardized across all the cities that, you know, did you collect, do you collect right now in, in your profiling uh, as part, um, you know, data on climate impacts? Uh, as well as traditional knowledge, which is part of the LLA, right? Really to look at how people have been coping or adapting um, and, and, and is that included? So over to you, Teresa. Okay, thank you. Maybe before Teresa comes through, can we have also, I don't know, Jaganata, if it's uh, a question, then Teresa can just uh, uh, respond. Okay, uh, okay I'll take, uh, thank you. Thanks, Beth, I'll take only 30 seconds. You see, my questions already have put in the chat box. I have only one observation. See, thinking out of box is necessary. I want to just respond. What is the use of collective data? No way. You have to get into people to define the action. For example, uh, I heard that there is no resource. There is no financial support. Arabhai, 
100 kg of wet waste in 40 days gets you 30 kg of compost. Each kg of compost is worth money. Segregate waste at source, money is there. So this out-of-box thinking is required. Data, data, data for what? I don't understand. See, what we have to do, we have to do little out-of-box thinking. So in summary, I want to tell, these initiatives are wonderful, but allow people, allow community to decide what they want. Not we trained in a particular way, you know, we have a mindset. Let us be mindful by allowing the community to decide what they want. Thank you very much, uh, Beth, and all the uh, participants. It was a nice experience. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Teresa, over to you to respond to, uh, to Swati's uh, question, as well as uh, maybe you also your point of view on uh, uh, Jagannatha's uh, inputs. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, regarding Swati's question, um, yeah, it it opened a lot of opportunities. Actually, it highlighted the needs and it highlighted uh, the needs of the urban poor and also highlighted how the urban poor is being impacted by all these um, uh, issues around and how uh the uh, covid exacerbated these issues of the urban poor so um actually right now we have uh we have different cities where um uh a uh, a city government uh contacted the federation to uh to organize all the urban gardeners 300 groups of gardeners uh, that is uh, that are um, uh, organized by the, the the city, but they want uh, these uh, uh, gardeners to know uh, to understand how the federation is um, using the saving scheme uh, to tackle other issues of uh, poverty. So uh, you see uh, the. I think uh, this is a COVID. I think it's a double-bladed sword. Yeah, it 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 uh, you know it brought about a lot of problem, but it also uh, opened up a lot of opportunities for the urban poor uh, to strengthen their uh, relationship with the government. So that's one. Um, uh, with the question of um, with the with the comment of the uh, Jagannatha uh, regarding the the data. Actually, data, yeah, of course, it is a neutral thing. It is it, it can be used uh, by the you know uh, the community cannot use it if they don't they are not empowered to use it. I think uh, data with a, a level of organizing is a tool that is so powerful that can bring about change because we use data to negotiate we use data to leverage we use these data to uh, plan uh, how to tackle our issues deciding what to do and you know uh, um, uh, giving us a more uh, a deep uh, understanding of how to do it and what are the limitations um, in the in in our resources, of course. So, yeah, it it opens a lot of uh, you know it, it opens a lot of solution. But yeah, you are correct that if data alone, it's it it doesn't change anything in the settlement. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. And um, if we were able to clap, we would clap for all our uh, presenters and our responders. And of course, uh, you, uh, our audience, uh, for a very uh, invigorating and uh, insightful uh, conversation. We apologize uh, for cutting people short and uh, for not having an opportunity to take all your questions and your intervention. Uh, there is a request uh, in, uh, in the chat box uh, around sharing of some of the presentations. I, I, we can definitely do that if people can put um, their, their contact uh, email addresses in the chat and we can follow up. 
I think also I'm I'm correct, Ariana, isn't it that this will these these are also going to be uh, published? Uh, these uh, sessions are going to be published uh, either on the IID website or uh, perhaps on on YouTube. Uh, yes, so there that's, might be an opportunity. Okay. Yeah. Um, and for me, just to say thank you for, for, for taking your time, we uh, kind of like ran over a bit, but I'm glad that we managed to catch everyone and uh, everyone got an opportunity to, um, to say something. So I uh, have um, a fruitful rest uh, of the conference uh, and from us, from SGI and Cities Alliance, thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone.